I'm Jerry Weaver. I'm an alcoholic. <clears throat> my sobriety date's July 2nd, 1989. And uh, my home group is a group called There Is a Solution. We meet on Tuesdays and Thursdays, 7 o'clock at the uh, United Methodist Church in Holly Springs, North Carolina. Matter of fact, they're, they're meeting right now. They're having a business meeting tonight too, which worries me a little bit that I'm not <laughs> that I'm not there to make sure they don't vote anything in crazy. But um, anyway, good to be here tonight. Um, good to be sober. Thanks for dinner tonight, and thanks for the fellowship. I I, I really appreciate that. Um, good good to be in my right mind tonight, and uh, and to know that uh, uh, that there's a solution to my problem. I'm a, I'm a guy that has. Uh, I've been sober since my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I don't say that to, to impress anybody or to try to separate myself from anybody or to claim I'm better than anybody else. It's just a fact that I've been sober ever since I was introduced to Alcoholics Anonymous. And, and uh, the main reason that I, that I tell you that is when, uh, when I got sober, I mean, I, I was just like a lot of other people. I had a lot of stuff going on. I didn't have anywhere to live. I, I didn't have a vehicle. I didn't have a job. I had owed a lot of money. I had people out to get me. My wife was sleeping with my cousin, which ain't good. And uh, uh, it's all right to laugh. Uh, and um, and I would go to meetings, and even with all that that against me, I was a guy that was introduced to the solution of AA very quickly. I was introduced to the book, I was introduced to the literature, I was introduced to the steps. I was, you know, I, I did a fourth and a fifth step at about five weeks sober and was making amends, going back and cleaning up the past at seven, eight weeks sober. And, and I was feeling pretty good about what was going on and even though I had a lot of stuff going on and, you know, and was, I was full of fear and, and, you know, I didn't know if everything was going to work out but there was something inside of me that I just knew that if I st stuck with AA that, that I'd be okay. And I would go to meetings and I'd hear people talking about other stuff. They'd be whining about this or whining about that. And they were talking about how they didn't want to be there and they wish they would have had stayed home. And I'm, and I, I'm, I'm somewhat glad to be there and I'm, I'm somewhat looking forward to the future of my life. And I started wondering if I'm you know, doing something wrong or overlooking something. And I was, I mean, I was sober about three or four months before I had ever, ever actually seen anybody like relapse. And a guy that I respected had gone back out and relapsed. And I can remember it kind of devastated me. I was like, man, I didn't know. I mean, I thought I didn't know that, that you could do, actually do that. And uh, I'm, I guess I'm a slow study. But, but then I started hearing people. I actually heard a guy in a meeting one night said that how when he relapsed, it enhanced his sobriety. And that, you know, he really got a full knowledge of his condition. And I'm thinking like, my goodness, what is that? And then I heard a guy true story, he said that, that he felt like relapse was a requirement. And uh, I'm sitting there thinking, I'm, I'm about eight or nine months sober, best I can remember. I may have been, I may, it may have been more like six months, but I think it was about nine months sober, and I'm starting more in my, in my head if maybe I'm missing something, and maybe I need to relapse or go back out, and um, it, just, it, just, it just, it was almost started to appear like doom and gloom. And I was in a meeting, at, in Dunn at the hut, about nine months sober. Guy walks in, speaker, gets up to the podium, starts talking, and I had never heard anything like this. This, this it was Tom, and uh, he was, it's, but he was, now keep in mind, this was 24 years ago. So he had a lot more hair, he was, you know, buff. <laughs> He was. Had those big ears sticking out. But anyway, he got up, and one of the first things that he, and I'm not here to memorialize Tom, this is a true story. He, he got up and he said, one of the first things he said was that he had been sober since his first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I had never heard anybody say that. And he went on to talk a little bit about how what he found here could be permanent and that it could last forever. That was a little different speak than I'd heard some of these other folks talking about. And, and, and he was full of confidence and, I mean, full of power. And it absolutely, it changed, it changed my life. 
it, it it did. I mean, it. I mean, what it looked like to me, it, from what I was hearing, was that we had to always be on guard, and we were walking on thin ice at all times, and that that it was just it was just this weak approach to 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 the program and to recovery, and um, I mean th that was the exact opposite of what he was of what he was saying, and I've never quite looked at Alcoholics Anonymous the same since then, and. What I can tell you is that what I have found here can be permanent, and that that you know there ain't there doesn't have to be this revolving door that you hear about, and that that I know for a fact that I suffer from alcoholism, and that Alcoholics Anonymous is 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 much more than just some first aid kit, of something that I just come float in and out of, and and you know and try to feel better and and just get a, just a little bit of a hold on my alcoholism, that. What's happened to me as a result of being a member of AA and coming in and actually doing some stuff that people ask me to do is I've been able to recreate my life. And I've, I'm not rebuilding the old life. I'm not trying to remodel it. I'm not trying to get anything back. I'm, I've been able to recreate my life as a, as a, as a result of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I mean, I, not only have I been able to stay sober, but, but Alcoholics Anonymous has given me some purpose. It's given me some, some uh, it's helped me to be whole. And, and most importantly, I'm not, I'm free today. I am absolutely, I'm as free as anybody I know. And, and uh, I couldn't say that when I got here. I mean, I was a guy that was governed, my life was governed by self-centered fear. And uh, so anyway, Tom, thanks for uh, telling me that you'd been sober since your first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, and congratulations on 57 years, that's a long time. And I'll also say this, not long after that, I, was in, I went to a meeting in Sanford with a guy, and I heard Wallace Bryant speak for the first time, not long after that, and I was absolutely hypnotized when, now that was, again, about 24 years ago, that was, Wallace looked about the same as he does now. <laughs> <laughs> Well, ain't it true, Steve? I mean, he ain't changed much. Huh? He hadn't changed much. But uh, when I heard him talk, I'd never heard anything like that. I mean, what a, that is probably one of the best stories of Alcoholics Anonymous ever. That he, he, he is, when I heard him talk, I mean, it, it basically drove home the fact that what the book says on page 100 is absolutely true, that you can be free regardless of what your circumstances are. And again, I got some hope, and I started doing what those, what those guys were doing. I started hanging out with the same guys that were associated with them. And all I can tell you is, man, I, I don't regret that one bit. It's, it's absolutely, it's made me the man that I am today. And I've been, I've been able to grow up in Alcoholics Anonymous with uh, some really great examples of, of how to live a principle-centered life. I started drinking when I was 12 years old. And uh, congratulations on 50 years, by the way, Wallace. Yeah, that's a long time. Uh, I started drinking when I was 12, and, uh, you know, I had a lot of reasons not to drink. I, I'd seen alcohol cause all kinds of problems for my family. Uh, I come from a long line of, of, of alcoholics and a long line of, uh, of chaotic, rebellious people, I guess would be a good way to say it, that, that like to uh, get in a lot of trouble and act like none of it happened the next day. And uh, you ever done that? Yeah. Uh, and uh, I, was a, I was also a kid that was just full of fear and full of doubt and full of insecurity. And at the age of 12, when I drank some old granddad whiskey, I found that all that went away. All those fears and insecurities and doubts that I had about my life just kind of disappeared and alcohol gave me power. And it just made me feel like I was the king. Um, and I can remember that night in the basement of that house just like it was right now. And it, it's still vivid in my mind. I had, it had a profound impact on me. The next morning, I woke up in a pile of vomit. I couldn't remember everything that happened the, the night before. But the first thought that came to me was, my God, I got to do that again. And I mean, that's, that's exactly what happened. I, I went right back at it. It was either that, the next day or the day after that, I started right back drinking on that bottle of whiskey. And the same thing happened. It, it, my life changed. I mean, it, 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 it transformed me into, uh, into a different person. And, and basically what happened to me was as a, as a young kid, I, I started to, to, to drink excessively as a teenager. I got into a lot of trouble. I got into a lot of, uh, uh, I was just a, a, re a rebellious, chaotic kid. 
that didn't want anybody to tell me what to do. And I was also a guy that was, was absolutely full of fear. And I discovered, I mean, as, as 13, 14 years old, that you, know, you drink some beer, drink some wine, or drink some whiskey before school or during school and after school, that, that all that fear could go away. And I was, I was a guy that was absolutely, I mean, I, I knew that I was able to do things when I was drinking that I couldn't do when I wasn't drinking. I, I didn't have any fear. And, I, I mean, I, I drank pretty excessively as a, as a 13 or 14-year-old. I uh, was labeled a juvenile delinquent at the age of 13. I thought that was pretty cool. And, uh, and was kicked out of a, in a, an entire school system and was told basically not to come back. And I thought that was real cool. Uh, then the next school system that, that we went to, I got kicked out of that one too. And I don't know that people, kids actually get kicked out of the entire school systems anymore, but they, I mean, I was actually asked not to come back. And I didn't realize it at the time, but you know, my family would actually have to move so I could go to school. And uh, I just thought they were leaving because my dad was fooling around on my mom and he was trying to get away from his girlfriend. But I know now that it was, it was a combination of both. And, uh, <laughs> uh, um, but anyway, I, uh, you know, and my, and my parents didn't know what to do with me. I can remember them having, like, they'd have family meetings. I wasn't invited. And, uh, but they was, I can remember hearing them talking about what they were going to do with me and uh, how, how nervous they were about, the, you know, what I was doing. And they were going to send me off to military school and something happened with that. And uh, the, the court system was trying to get me into the, the juvenile detention uh, system and my dad you know, thank God he did a, did a good job of keeping me out of that. Um, but I just continued to, to as a teenager, I mean, alcohol dominated my life. It was, it was, it, it was, it was all I wanted to do was, was to party and uh, to get into a lot of trouble. I got into a lot of trouble in Harnett County. I was charged with assault with a deadly weapon with intent to kill and assault on a police officer. And uh, that doesn't go over real well. And that's how I ended up in the military. Uh, but, <laughs> They, uh, I went into the, uh, if they give you an option, uh, I mean, I, I wasn't that dumb. So I, I, I went into the, mil into the Air Force. Um, I had just turned 18 years old, and I can remember thinking, this is going to change my life. And my plan was to go in and uh, uh, to get some discipline and get some responsibility, get some education, and to, tr and to prove everybody that I could do something, that I could amount to something. And I can tell you that never happened. Um, I, uh, I crashed and burned quick. I mean, I right out of basic training, I start right, I, I'm right back drinking. I'm blacking out, can't remember th everything that happens. Uh, people that I go out to bars with, I'm getting in fights with them, and the next morning I don't remember anything about it. And they'd have to tell me what I did. I woke up one morning, and uh, I, I was stationed up in Rantoul, Illinois. And uh, that's a, not a good place to be. I don't know if anybody's ever been to Rantoul, but it's a... It's basically a bunch of cornfields south of Chicago or south of Champaign. And uh, I was living in this all men's dorm, about 200 guys in the dorm. And we, uh, we partied a lot and got, you know, would get in and out of trouble. And, uh, but the way the dorm, the way the thing was situated, you had a room here that two guys lived in. And there was a bathroom. And there was another room here that two guys lived in. And four people shared a bathroom. I woke up one morning. We'd been out partying at, uh, in Champaign where the University of Illinois is, I felt something cold on me, and I looked around. I'm laying on the bathroom floor, and it's all, all men's dorm, but it's not my bathroom. And I uh, started looking around, trying to figure out what happened. I couldn't quite figure it out. I looked around. I'm, I'm dressed up in some women's clothing. And uh, <laughs> it's not a good thing to wake up in a men, all men's dorm with 200 guys dressed up like a woman. Uh, I don't recommend that. And uh, I... Uh, that's one of the times you're glad you had a blackout grasshopper so you, don't, you, you can't remember, you don't want to know what happened. And uh, things like this would happen and I, would, uh, I wouldn't think much about it. I just thought everybody kind of blacked out when they drank. And um, I know now that most people don't black out when they drink. And uh, I got stationed at Pope Air Force Base after that and I got married. And you know, I got married at a young age thinking that was going to fix me and teach me some responsibility and that, that didn't happen. And, you know, what I can tell you is, is that I, um, 
I mean, alcohol basically just dominated my life. I was a bad husband. I was a bad member of the Air Force. I was a bad member of the community. Um, I was, uh, you know, I was selfish and self-centered, and all I was worried about was what I could get and people doing stuff for me and being ma manipulative and um, just out for myself. And I, I thought I played that off well. I thought that, you know, that I was, I was kind and, and considerate to people, but I always had a hidden motive. And when that didn't work, I'd get mad and get indig indignant, and I'd, or I'd try to make people feel sorry for me, and I could always, you know, manipulate my wife or my family and get what I wanted. And uh, family started getting, putting pressure on me to quit drinking, especially my father-in-law after I got married. And I, uh, you know, I didn't think I had a problem drinking. I, my best I could tell, alcohol was a solution. And you know, I always had it in my mind that if things really got bad that I could, I could quit on my own. And things got bad and I couldn't quit. Not that I was trying to, but I can remember having these ideas or these thoughts of, you know, I'm going to slow down or I'm, I'm just going to get it together and I'm not going to get in any trouble. And, uh, I mean, that just, that just never happened. And I started to, uh, I started to look for ways to, to, to quit drinking. I got involved with a church and, uh, I mean, that was an experience. It was a free will Baptist. Pretty this particular one was really had a real conservative uh, preacher and couldn't listen to music. Couldn't listen to music and watch TV and uh, they wouldn't. You know, all the women had to wear dresses and no makeup type thing. And I don't know if they do that anymore. Than, but that's what they did back then. And uh, I'd go in there drunk and I'd go in there hungover and I, I mean I it was just a it was just a mess and. They tolerated me, and I um, I stayed involved with them for three or four months. And I would go in, you know, and I'd go in there like being being on a two or three day drunk and go in drunk and uh, leave there just fit, being full of guilt and full of remorse, you know, about about what I was doing and why I was living. And I uh, I started listening to gospel music on the uh, on the radio, and I don't know why, but I had I had this old beat up. 72 Volkswagen Beetle bug and it was armed, it was bright orange. It's not a good car for an alcoholic to have, especially if you're driving around drunk a lot because it just, you could see it coming a mile away. <laughs> but in the mornings it would pick up this radio station that was broadcast from Larnberg Maxson Air Base and there was this guy that came on there named Brother Strickland. Now I don't know if anybody knows who, knows who Brother Strickland is, but he was some guy that would come on this thing and they would play this gospel music. And I would turn that stuff on, I would listen to it, and I'd start singing, driving to, uh, from, from Coates to Pope Air Force Base. And I would pray for God to help me and to keep me sober and to get my life in order. And I'd get to the parking lot there on base, and I'd pray with them on the radio. And <laughs> about 10, 11 o'clock, my, yeah, my mind would start messing with me, right, and tell me, you know what, Jerry, everything's okay. You're making a big deal out of nothing. And, Next thing you know, I'm, yeah, I'm going off to lunch and getting a bottle of Thunderbird wine or some aristocrat vodka and getting drunk at lunch, come back and working on airplanes drunk. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm carrying a little new, new, one of those little pocket New Testaments around with me in my front pocket of my uniform, and I'm pulling that thing out on breaks and reading it to people at work and preaching to them. And <laughs> I, uh, it's just, just crazy. And I, I mean, I had this thing that if I could, you know, I, just change the out the outsides and try to look good in front of people or, or kind of you know trick people into thinking I'm doing okay that something would change and I shaved my head around that time and I thought that was going to keep me sober and I, I uh, yeah I drank with this guy that that uh, drank just like I did we would get drunk a lot at lunch and, and at night and he came into work one morning and his head was shaved and I asked him I said well what's up with your head and he said that he had hooked up with his organization that believed that the problems of man stems from their hair and that their, their program of action was that they shave their hair off. And what that signifies is that the, you know, your old ideas die or the old man dies. And um, when, you, when your hair grows back, you're reborn. And I was like, well, you get, you get this. You get a... Uh, kind of get a new way to live. I was like, man, I need some of that. So I, I went home and shaved my head. And 
I was an absolute idiot. I don't know how else to say it. <laughs> yeah. you know, li the literature talks about being f in full flight from reality. And I mean, that's what I was. I'm, I'm, you know, I got that new pocket, that New Testament in my front pocket and that shaved head. I'm driving down the road listening to Brother Strickland and that gospel music and you know, praying with him on the radio. And uh, by lunchtime, I'd be drunk. And I didn't know what was wrong with me. I'd make promises to my wife, and you know, I'd, I'd make a promise, and I'd leave the house, and I'd stay gone for two, three days. After after making the promise of going right to the store and coming back, and I wanted to come back, but my mind, yeah, would invariably turn to the thought of, well, you could probably just drink a butt, drink a beer, and you know, just get you a couple of Budweisers, and everything's going to be okay. Or I'd run into somebody and. They would ask me to go with them, and next thing you know, I'm off to the races. And you know, I, I didn't understand. I didn't understand what was wrong with me. And I went and saw a psychiatrist. I didn't. That, that didn't go very well. And you know, basically, what happened to me was, in my mind, I had tried everything to get my life in order, and nothing worked. And I, uh, I really hated what I was doing to my family. Uh, in particular, I mean, I, it. it I mean, as, as goofy as I was and as, as, as far out there as I was, I mean, I did have a conscience. And I, I really, when I wasn't drinking, I mean, it, the, the, the guilt and the remorse of the way I was living, was, I mean, it haunted me. And I really wanted to change, but I didn't know how. And I, uh, I got suicidal. I, th I really thought my family and, and just the world would be better off without me. And I, uh, second suicide attempt, I had this dog that had mange. <laughs> and I tried to stop telling the story, but every time I don't tell it, people get mad at me. So I'll, I'll tell it. Um, it's not that good of a story, really. But I had this dog that had mange, and the vet had given us this poison to kill the mange on this dog. And uh, just to let you know, I'm not real bright. So I had this bright idea that, well, if, if it'll kill mange, maybe it'll kill a man. And I, uh, I came home one night and was just full of guilt and full of self-pity and full of remorse and I pulled some of it up into a syringe and I, I shot it up my arm and laid down the kitchen floor in the house and I went away from here for a little while and when uh, <laughs> when they were uh, they were bringing me back I, I can remember fighting it and whatnot but Anyway, that led to, I, I ended up, I was in the hospital for five days. And my, my dad actually checked, checked me into a, a, I was still in the Air Force. and My dad had checked me into a civilian hospital under my brother's name and, in Raleigh, which was a whole nother fiasco because the you know, people would come in and call you Jerry and the nurse would say, I thought his name was John. And, oh, yeah, that's John. And it was just... It was a mess, but I got out of the hospital after five days, and I just knew I would never drink again. And after going through that near-death experience, and I knew that my life would never be the same, that it was going to be different. I was out of the hospital for three days and was right back drinking. And all the circumstances that, that comes with that and all the pain and suffering that I caused my, myself and my family after going through that, that suicide attempt and you know just the things that, that come with drinking none of that stuff comes into my mind with sufficient amount of force to prevent me from taking the drink the, the, book, the book calls that plain insanity and I mean that's what it is is that, that you know I, I, I can't I don't, have a, I don't have any defense against the first drink that no matter how hard I try on my own power, no matter how hard my wife tries or the Air Force tries or Harnett County deputy tries, that when that hits me, there's no defense. I'm going to drink. And that's why I need Alcoholics Anonymous. That's why I need to have a relationship with, with a higher power. Because that, that ultimately will become my defense against a drink. If I don't have that, I'm going to drink again. And I didn't know that at the time. I didn't know that was that's what was wrong with me. Um, but, you know, I, so I, I was right back off to the races. And the good news is I've never had to mange since then. And, uh, 
as I've aged, I think it's helped my hair grow in. <laughs> if y'all haven't been able to tell. Uh, I, I, uh, Steve could use some. Uh, and I, I just, I, I just lived in this, um, this delusional state of depression. I don't know how else to say it for the next several months. I got discharged out of the Air Force. And I'm basically living like an animal, living in a house that we're getting ready to lose, the motor in the Volkswagen blowed up. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just living like an animal, doing things I never thought I would do, hanging out with people I never, never thought I'd hang out with. And um, I, I attempted suicide one more time. I actually borrowed a car from a guy and, and pulled it into the garage and laid down by the exhaust pipe. And, started sucking on the, the exhaust pipe, and I don't recommend that either. Um, and, and, and what happened, obviously I got through that, but I can remember after that just feeling sorry for myself and uh, having these thoughts of, you know, look at what you people have done to me. And, you know, and at, this, at this point, my wife had left, and her family was not wouldn't have anything to do with me. I would have told you that my family didn't want to have anything to do with me. That probably wasn't, wasn't even close to being true, but in my mind, everybody had abandoned me and left me, and here I am. And, and I'm blaming everybody. I'm blaming my dad, my mom, the Air Force, the Harnett County deputy. I'm blaming my, my, my wife for everything that has happened to me. And absolutely just obsessed with myself. And it's always somebody else's fault. It's always I was given a bad deal and I was given a bad hand. If you were raised like I was, you'd be in the same shape I'm in and on and on and on and on. And uh, what happened was one morning I left the guy's house to go write a bad check. And it was about an eight mile walk. And something happened to him as I was walking down the road. And I got to tell you this, that that morning, there wasn't a whole lot going on in my life. And I was actually pretty excited about getting the cash for the bad check and going by the bootleggers and actually coming back to Wayne's house. I mean, and, and um, I had no plans of getting sober. I had no plans that morning of my life turning around. My plan was to go write the bad check. And something happened to me, and it was not no blinding bush experience like that, but it was like this moment of clarity came to me, and I, I realized that I had just turned 22 and that my life should be starting, it shouldn't be ending. And I wanted to die, I didn't want to die. And it was like I saw myself for what, really what I was for the first time, it was like I was just an absolute zero, as the literature talks about. And I was just an absolute, complete loser. And all that, all that ego and pride that I had, it was like it just disappeared. And, and all this is hindsight. And, and I basically had run out of, I had run out of angles. And man, I was a guy that would work an angle and work a con, I mean, just in a minute. It was like all that stuff was gone. And all that shucking and jiving and trying to be cool was it, it, like it just disappeared. And I, I said two things out loud. I said, there's got to be something better than this. And I said, God, please help me. I've been sober ever since. And I don't want to imply that some magic potion came down and hit me and I like man let's go get sober that's not at all what happened but something happened and I mean, my plan was to go get to write the bad check and go get some some booze and go back to Wayne's house and the next thing I know I'm sitting in a detox and you know I, I looking back on that whole experience I, I think what happened to me and I didn't know these words then but the the the, the the, the first three steps of Alcoholics Anonymous moved in my life. Something happened to me. And, and I think we call it surrender in AA. But I didn't make that happen. I, I just, I was surrendered by something else. And it was like something just came down and turned me around and put me on a completely different path. And it was not my plan. And so, I, you know, I, I ended up in this detox and I, uh, to show you how willing I was now, so when, I, when my dad took me to the detox, they, 
and, and back then, they, they, most of these places were charging a, a lot of money to, to get in, right? And uh, at least this one was. And they asked me if I had any insurance. <laughs> well, I'm not even working. I, I mean, I, I, but, but when he said, hey, you got any insurance? I was like, sure, yeah, I got some insurance. And uh, it's just like, you know, a lie will quickly come out of your mouth, right? And, uh, and uh, I, uh, I, I gave him a fake insurance number and, and a, a fake, well, it was a, it was a real insurance company name that I used, but I just made up a number. And uh, I did get to write that bad check. He asked me if we had any money. He said it was going to cost you $500 to, you know, to, to get in. And I was like, well, yeah, I got plenty of money. I wrote, him. <laughs> I wrote that check out for $500 of that detox. And so that was willing to go to any lengths. And I didn't even realize what that was at the time. <laughs> And uh, it didn't take them long to figure it out, though. Um, but what happened to me in there was when I, when I got in there, um, a guy from AA came and, and basically did a 12-step call on me. And he came in and he just started talking about himself. And I had never, I had never heard anything like that before in my life. I mean, I had, I had plenty of people come and tell me what they thought I ought to be doing. I had people come in and ask me if I, you know, what seems to be your problem. That always cracks me up. You go see a psychiatrist and they ask you, well, what do you think your problem is? Well, daggone, that's what I'm paying you for. I mean, aren't you supposed to be telling me? And um, all this guy did was he basically talked about himself. He talked about how he drank. He talked about how he was hopeless. He talked about the desperation of his drinking. And I could identify with that. And... As a matter of fact, the literature says that's one of the most important things that we can do is to try to get the person to identify with that hopeless condition and that, that try to reach an understanding with that person and that really until that happens, there ain't much hope for you. And that's what happened to me when that guy came and talked to me was I, I, I knew that he had been where I'd been. He'd felt like I felt. He drank like I did. And uh, there, was, there was an identification there, and the guy gave me some hope because he'd been sober for several years at the time. And he told me that if I was like him, that there was a solution. And that, you know, that if I wanted to stay sober and if I was willing to keep an open mind and do some things different, that I might could change my life. And he also told me to do something that uh, he, he, told me to, he told me to go back to my room and to, to get on my knees and just ask for help. And he said, it doesn't matter if you believe or don't believe what your beliefs are. He says, just, just, just ask, just get on your knees and ask for help. And I went and did it. And I, you know, it seems to work. I've been doing it every day since then. Um, and, and, you know, something happened to me. I was, I was quickly introduced to Alcoholics Anonymous. I was introduced to the literature. I was introduced to the steps. And I was... Um, I was just quickly told that, that we get better in Alcoholics Anonymous by taking action. And that it's, it's, not, an, it's not an analytical, mechanical process that, or it's not just going to meetings. It, that, that we've got to start taking these steps and we've got to start trying to live different and take some different actions. And I don't know why I was willing to do it. I don't know why I opened my mind up, maybe because I'd been beaten up so bad or whatever, but um, I, and, and what happened to me was I, I, I just went to speaker meetings for a while. And I was basically told not to go to a discussion meeting, that you didn't have a whole lot to say and some of that stuff. And I would go to speaker meetings and I'd hear people speak and it would give me some hope that, you know, well, maybe if they can stay sober, maybe I can stay sober. And I... Um, I did, that, I did a fourth step and a fifth step very quickly and at about five weeks sober. And what happened to me was that, that for the very first time in my life, I realized that I had done a bad job running my life. And it, it, it wasn't, again, any like mystical or magical experience, but I, realized, I knew that all those people I had blamed my life on had done nothing but try to help me. And that I never took responsibility for anything. You know, I always, it was just always somebody else's fault. And that it just kind of hit me that, if, if, that I needed to get serious about life. That life wasn't a game. Life wasn't a joke. And that I couldn't, you know, just, you know, treat it that way. 
And, you know, when I told that stuff to a guy, I started to become free of it, and I started to see the truth. And the truth wasn't real good. And I, uh, I went back and started making amends to folks. I went to talk to some family members. I went and I had some, some hot checks out I had to go make good on. I didn't have the money to pay it back, but I went and talked to the people and told them I was going to pay them as soon as I got the money and was told not to hide from that. And other folks that I owed money to, I made arrangements. And uh, I went down to the courthouse in Harnett County, and I had some pending, uh, pending charges down there, and I turned myself in, which uh, you know, didn't make a whole lot of sense. I mean, in my mind, hey, if they got warrants out for you, it's, it's their responsibility to come get you, right? You're supposed to keep... <laughs> Right, You're supposed to keep hiding and you know and ducking and, um, but I was told if I wanted to stay sober, I had to clean that stuff up and I had to quit looking over my shoulder and all that. And so I did it. You know what? It wasn't a big deal. I mean, it didn't feel good. And I didn't want to do it, but by taking those actions and and, and putting faith in and really probably at that time the program and, and a couple of people, um, things started to change. And I started to realize real quickly that by taking right action. I got different results, and that the things that I never thought would ha would would work out started working out. And you know, I got a job. A guy took a chance on me and gave me a job. The same guy that I borrowed that car from to commit suicide gave me a, that car to drive back and forth to the job. And my I lost the house, and uh, my wife's not coming back, and. Um, my dad gave me a, opened up his living room in his house and let me stay there for a while. And, you know, I started to stay sober. My life started to, you know, to, to, started to work out. And I, um, I, mean, I was a guy that was stark raving sober. And I'll tell you what, just what, what's happened to me over the years is that, I mean, my life is, me and my first wife got back together after I, after I was sober, I don't know, Somewhere around nine months to a year, we got back together. We actually were able to get the house back. And um, it didn't work out. We got divorced. I was about four years sober. We got divorced. And um, I thank God for good sponsorship. There's two things that I've always, I guess, I've always had. I've always had a strong home group, and I've always had a good sponsor. Matter of fact, I've had the same sponsor now for... Uh, about 22 years and because of good sponsorship and because I've been willing to, to be in the middle of AA whenever anything life has thrown me or I've you know, I've decided to make poor decisions I've always had a, I've always been been led the right way through through sponsorship and I've been able to get through life situations because of good guidance um, from a, from a sponsor and I, I was about five years sober and I'd gone through a divorce, and I'd stolen money from work, and I actually had, had turned myself in for stealing the money, and I paid the money back, and because it wasn't mine to take, and all that's because of good sponsorship. If it was left up to me, I wasn't going to turn that money back. And 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 what happened to me was I started to to fully come to understand what step six and seven are in our program that it's really about getting on with the business of life and I got to ask myself the question, am I really willing to change? Do I want to change? Do I have a desire to move to something better? And I stayed, I stayed caught up in a really unhealthy relationship because I was afraid to get out of it and I was afraid that maybe there's nothing better. And I stole money from work because I was afraid they weren't, I wasn't going to have enough money. And I started justifying it because I work hard and they don't pay me enough. And bottom line was I was afraid that if I did the right thing that, that I wasn't going to be taken care of. And I can remember when I went through those, 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 those two times and um, I can remember telling Paige, you know, hey, there's not much in the big book on step six and seven. And he looked at me and he told me, he said, and it was... It, this was, this was another time like when I heard Tom say that he'd been sober since his first meeting of A. This was another one of those aha moments where it just literally changed the course of my life. Paige looked at me and he said, there was more you could do that would be more written. 
And it hit me, and I'm like, what's he talking about? But it, it hit me, he says, your job is to be willing to change and to, and to stop whatever it is you're doing and to give up and allow God and allow the program to enter into your life and change and move you on to something better. And that your, your, your part in that is to, to be done with it and stop doing it. And, you know, I'm one of those guys that well, I really don't want to do it. You know, and two hours later, I'm doing it, right? I, I really didn't want to do that. Well, of course you wanted to do it. He would say, you, if you really want to know what you believe, look at what you do. <laughs> you know, we, we always do what we, what we believe. And, uh, um, but when he told me that, I, I started to realize that, you know, I did things. I stole money from work just pure out of fear. I stayed in a sick relationship purely out of fear. And bottom line for me was that I doubted what the program could do for me. I doubted what God could do for me. I doubted what principles could do with me if I would fully apply them in my life. And after that experience, I started to realize that, that, that if I'll do what I'm capable of doing, that God will do the rest. God will do, work out what I can't do. And that, that I'll, never, I'll never get more than I give. And that I've got to start applying principles in all my life. And I've got to start taking, taking this program and, and use it as a way of life. Not as just something that I go to or something that I apply here when it feels good or I apply over here when, you know, when the heat's on. That it's, it's a way of life. And I started to realize that AA is a lot more than just something that I go to. And I was, um, and, and I, what I started doing was, I, you know, when I, in my home group, I mean, I'd get to my home group early, and I'd be prepared, and I'd help out, and I'd be, be kind to people and polite to people, and I'd stay late, and I'd clean up, and I was always trying to help out. And it hit me one night, well, if I'd start maybe acting like that everywhere, at work, at home, in a relationship, then maybe things would change. And I started trying to apply the traditions and, and the steps at, at home and at work and in the community and everywhere that I went. My life just completely took a whole different angle. And I, I can tell you this, I haven't stolen anything since, since that time and I haven't been in a relationship like that since then. I've tried to treat people differently. Um, and I've, uh, I'm a guy today that's you, know, you you probably hear us a lot, but blessed beyond measure, in that that uh, I, I was on the same job for about 24 years. I went from basically sweeping the floor to stealing money from them to being a president of one of their companies. That's not because of anything that I've done. That's because alcohol numbs works, and that, and that's because when I started started giving and I stopped living for myself and started started applying these principles there, remarkable things started to happen. Um, and I mean, I did, I, you know, I, I did things and that, a, that a guy like me is not supposed to do. On paper, I can't do half the jobs I've done. And, but with principles and with, 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 with God and the program, I can do a lot of stuff that I'm not supposed to do. And I've been uh, remarried now for 18 years, got a good marriage. Um, you know, the minute I gave that up and tried not to make stuff happen, the minute somebody showed up in my life. And, you know, we got a good marriage. We don't try to change one another. We don't, uh, you know, we don't bicker and we don't fight. And we don't do battle. And um, I'm well respected in the community and in my family. And, um, I'm a leader in my family now, which sometimes is a pain in the butt. Uh, <laughs> but my family calls me for help. They call me for suggestions. They call me for advice. They ask me to speak at stuff. When people die, they ask me to talk, which, which is always, always uh, amazes me. I was, you know, I was a guy that was asked to leave at Thanksgiving dinner at Grandma's house, you know, because I was, because I was drunk, and. Um, <clears throat> So I've, uh, you know, I've had a good life um, as a as a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and it's not over. I got a long ways I got a long ways to live, and um, I'm a guy that uh, is absolutely committed to uh, 
to being a good member of Alcoholics Anonymous and absolutely committed to trying to help other people. And, you know, of everything that's, that's happened to me in my life and all the things that I've been able to experience, the most important thing is that, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous uh, is a gift. And my life today is a gift. And it's important for me to, to do something with that. And what that means is that my job is to try to help somebody else. And that when I, when I reach my hand out and try to help somebody else, it's, it's riddled through, it's riddled, it's all in our literature. I mean, you can't read two or three pages where it doesn't talk about trying to be of service and trying to help somebody else. It makes several references to, you know, when, when, you, when, you, when you're down and out, work with another alcoholic will save the day. When all other measures fail, try to work with another alcoholic. My question is why try other measures? Just go work with another alcoholic. And, um, you know, much has been given to me as a, as a result of Alcoholics Anonymous and much is, much is expected from me is what, is, is what I believe. And it's just my responsibility to, uh, to, treat, to reach out and try to help other people. And, you know, when I got sober, I was just hoping to maybe get a job and maybe get a car back and maybe have my wife come back and leave my cousin alone. Um, <laughs> and uh, I've been given a, you know, I've been given a completely new way to live, and and uh, I've been given uh, you know the key the keys to the kingdom and a life that's just full of purpose and meaning. And uh, I appreciate y'all listening to me. Thanks.